Before I start, I would like to request the members of the audience to post in their questions during the session on the right side of the screen in the Q&A dialog box. Our last session of today, as well as of Charcha 2021, will focus on preparing a world-class skilled workforce for international mobility. The panelists of the session are Jitika Patankar, Additional Secretary, Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship, Sita Sharma, Migration Expert, International Labour Organization, Basa Banerjee, Director, Magic Billion, Amit Saxena, CEO, Ambe International. The session will be moderated by Arun Kumar Pillai, who is the Chief Strategy Officer at National Skill Development Corporation. Arun has extensively worked in the field of skill development and education entrepreneurship and has been associated with organizations such as ENY and PWC. May I now request Arun to introduce the panelists and start the session. Over to you, Arun. Hi, thanks, Ishita. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and a very happy Independence Day. Um, I have with me a very good panel. In fact, uh, I hope one of the panelists, Madam Jyutika Pathankar, is trying to log in. So while she's doing it, I will uh, introduce this good pan this distinguished panel of it's a mix of you know practitioners, policy makers, and uh, uh, implementation implementation experts. Uh, and on this topic, which is very important, is about preparing a world class skill workforce for international mobility. Uh, let me quickly introduce you to the panel members. Uh, first is uh, Jutika, ma'am, if she joins, uh, uh, when she joins, but I'll just introduce her. She's presently the additional secretary in the Ministry of Skill Development, and she's a 1988 batch IS officer of UP Kheda. Uh, within right now at the Skills uh, Ministry, she heads the Sankal project, which is a 4,500 crore centrally sponsored scheme, and with support from World Bank. Uh, and this project has been doing a lot of innovative work in the skill space. Uh, she has also been the Director General of uh, NISBUD. Uh, in the rank of additional secretary and also she's she served as a special secretary uh, horticulture and up government and additional director general of the archaeological survey of india uh, ma'am if you are joining if you already joined welcome to the panel the second expert on the panel is uh, sita uh, sita sharma uh, sita is, is a migration expert at the international labor organization and she has over two decades experience in the sector with specialization in protection issues and international migration. She's re she received a master's degree from Australia and she's, she's completed a forced migration course at the University of Oxford, UK. Uh, having started a career in South Africa, she's currently based in the India Isle office where she leads the EU India common agenda for migration mobility project. This would be a key discussion today. Uh, uh, she has conducted research on various issues, including labor markets for migrants, developed tools for migrant integration, and facilitated dialogue between multiple stakeholders to strengthen the governance of migration. She's worked across several countries in Asia, Africa, and also seen interventions in Europe and the GCC countries. My fourth, third panelist is Basab, Basab Banerjee. Uh, he's a co founder of Magic Billion. Uh, Basab brings 40 years of international uh, experience in international vocational systems. Uh, he, he was, he's a, he's at first, he, he was in the army. So he's after tenure in the army, he's worked with the Reliance, Airtel and the ADB. Uh, he, he was at NSDC earlier and while at NSDC, he was responsible for designing the competency frameworks and establishing many of the sector skill councils. Uh, he also led the government of India efforts in UK, Germany, Australia, New Zealand and Japan. At Magic Billion, he works, he mobilizes, he trains high quality Indian talent. He's built a huge database of qualified candidates and is also setting up on a fine world class testing and training center. He's based in Delhi. And the last panelist uh, is Amit Saxena. Amit is uh, the CEO of Ambe International, Ambe International. He has over 20 years experience in recruitment, training, IT consulting and over eight years experience in recruitment for India, Dubai, Oman, and Qatar. He holds a bachelor's degree in electronics from Mumbai University and a master's degree in computers from Rice University, USA. He has IT consulting experience in India, US, UK with both Accenture and Sapient. And he's, he's also, he's one of the largest, uh, he heads one of the largest recruitment firms in the country. Welcome all of you to this panel. Thank um, you. Thank you. Uh, just checking, has Judika ma'am joined the panel? Okay, fine. Um, 
So let me set the context. Uh, first of all, uh, the case for international workforce mobility is well understood. You know, in the sense, uh, we have a young population, uh, a young, large young population, and there is a whole lot of, I mean, uh, there is a, a section of the world which has an aging workforce. So in, a, in an ideal world, this would have been in a perfect condition for markets. Uh, people would have easily moved off from, say, in, in, from India, moved to those countries, worked in those countries, etc. But uh, just that's not the case. So this market has so many barriers, uh, and that's where you need to bring in. There has to be some intent, there has to be some strategy around it, and there has to be a plan to how do you overcome these barriers and ensure that the flow happens. And that's where this whole thing about uh, uh, international workforce mobility strategy and planning right to the, from the government and also how business can collaborate with the government in doing so. The second point I would like to make is the importance of this. You know, The fact that uh, we had close to $80 billion as remittances from this uh, set of people who work outside the country and send funds home. And it, this significant amount contributes a lot to the, the economic uh, growth of this country. So the, therefore, while it is also an outlet for many skilled Indians to work in international settings, it's also an area where a lot of uh, funds can come in for economic growth. From these both pers both these perspectives, this is a, an important uh, uh, important element of the skills ministry or overall skilling plan which we have. Uh, I would start with actually I wanted to ideally start with the government perspective uh, from Ma'am. Uh, we just wait for her to join. Uh, but let me quickly go over to Sita because then I think. Uh, you would have to play a little more of that uh, role, you know, uh, because you are a neutral arbiter in the whole thing. So, first of all, Sita, very, very few people know what exactly ILO does in this international workforce mobility space. You know. uh, personally, I know you do a lot of good work and I would like you to use this opportunity to tell us what is it that ILO does and how does it help a country like India? Over to you, Sita. Thank you, Arun. Uh, pleased to be here. Welcome, everyone, uh, and happy Independence Day, of course. Um, so just to, uh, since people don't know the ILO and you've asked me to introduce us, um, I would just begin by saying that the International Labor Organization, for those who do not know, is a UN specialized agency for labor. So we set international standards in con through consultative processes with governments, employers, and workers. So we are a tripartite institution. Um, and um, we, so within that, within our role as mandated labor agency, we work on migration, um, largely to, from a rights perspective, to see how uh, labor markets uh, actually integrate uh, migrant labor and how their rights are also protected both at national and international contexts. Specifically, um, to look at the skills and mobility space, um, and I'll and I'll share an example. But before I come to that, we do a broad spectrum of things um, because of the role that we have as a labor agency. We look at um, capacity building um, and designing labor market information systems. We do research that looks at labor market needs and anticipates skill needs. Um, we look at um, you know, information that feeds into employment and training policies of countries. Um, and this is cross-sectionally as well as internationally. So it's also for countries to look out, in countries to look within. So it's looking across labor markets. We also look at um, strengthening employment policies in themselves and employment services. So we create tools uh, for migrants integration. We create, um, we look at things like minimum referral wages, for example, which we have done here in India. So we look at some of these issues. Um, but most importantly and critically, perhaps, our role comes in to look at um, facilitating governments um, across, so not just one government, but governments across, um, and developing their own coherence internally with their employment, skilling, and migration policies and, and activities, because that's a role we also play, as well as facilitating 
um, engagement of such entities across borders, so across countries. Um, we also, uh, in that, of course, engage uh, other social partners. So whether it is employers, whether it is unions, whether it is recruiters, um, we look at engaging lots of social partners so that the um, entire effort is towards labor market efficiencies and so that the rights are also protected. So we kind of try and look at win-win solutions for countries uh, internally um, when they develop their policies, but also when they engage externally, we try and facilitate and help with some of that external engagement because it's not always easy for countries to be in dialogue with each other and very much draw in other players. So we bring in multi-sectoral players into the whole space. And I think that's the value add that we very much try to bring in from the ILO side besides the research and the technical inputs that we are able to provide it is this facilitatory role of bringing in stakeholders really the key players who should be involved in a room if you will allow me i'll give you an example from the philippines because we've done some very interesting work there this is related to um, the human, they were looking at health workers. Philippines is a big origin country for nurses, for example, to go out of the country. Um, what we were looking at there is working with the health ministry who set up the human resources uh, network. So, so they have a network. They look at, um, so we help them to look at the data internally, to look at the number of workers they have, what are the anticipated needs going into their own future? What does the country look at and need in the future? But then also looking at uh, what do they have as people that could go out? What are the aspirations that could actually be uh, followed through and people could leave the country? But then we did extensive studies. We looked at equivalencies between their nursing occupation, working with the education department and nurses overseas. We also did this for India, by the way. But we looked at that. Um, we looked at also working with employers and their recruiters. So we actually had a circular migration program that looked at some of these nurses being able to take a sabbatical for one year, for example, and come back and train in the Philippines to help the people who were aspiring to go. And that actually works really well. But that cannot be done unless we have everybody in the room. So you had to have people who were looking at skills. You had to have trainers. You had to have the recruiters. You had to have employers in conversation. Yeah. And it's only when everyone started coming together that some of these very, very coherent and well-managed migration systems could actually work. So I'll come back later, but this was just to share an example of the kind of work that ILO does. Over to you, Arun. Yeah, thanks, Sita. Uh, it's obvious that uh, the ILO has probably the best convening power in this space uh, when it comes to bringing together so many stakeholders, governments and uh, recruiters and all everybody on a single table, single platform. And uh, I know what Sita and her team does here, but clearly we need to leverage more of their research in the sense what work they do and how do we integrate that research findings in our own designer programs. I think that would be something critical as we go ahead uh, planning the way forward for this international workforce mobility. Uh, so since uh, when Sita gives this overall big picture uh, kind of role that ILO plays, uh, I would also bring in two of the market, uh, actually people who operate at the market. You know, they understand it uh, much better than many of us, simply because unlike uh, uh, the domestic skill ecosystem, the international workforce ecosystem is totally demand driven. There is no way you can uh, uh, skill somebody and wait for and put him on a shelf and wait for the employer to come and pick up. So it all starts with demand. So the employer articulates the demand and then these set of agencies who work closely with them are able to translate that back into the ecosystem and we create uh, skilled people to match that. In. So in that respect, I would like to bring in Amit at this point in time. Amit, since you are, a, I mean, I mean, probably the one of the oldest players in this uh, in this in this ecosystem you have seen almost a lot of summers and winters of this ecosystem and pre covid is a phase which is also which you have been through now so can you and with specific focus to the traditional market like gcc can you give us some give us a picture the post covid what do you think are the opportunities and what do you think are the challenges that uh, an indian uh, uh, skilled workforce would face or are there markets, uh, the GCC markets, which we talk of, uh, do the opportunities, have they dried up? Have they, are we, are we seeing a 
a bigger kind of market happening post this uh, when this whole thing about vaccination uh, vaccination etc is addressed so can you just give us a picture of the both the opportunity and the challenges in the gcc market in particular sure sure thanks a lot uh, arun thank you firstly for having me on this panel um happy independence uh, day to everyone who's uh, watching and uh, thank you to nsdc for helping organize this i think it's a very important topic you know uh, we've been focused on uh, skilling for such a long time and we know that international mobility is also a big market so trying to bring them together i know is a is a is something that you personally um, have uh, been doing a lot of work in and i think it's an important area um so let's talk about the gcc the gulf countries which are essentially seven uh, countries uh, which you know every year hire approximately uh, before covid 15 to 20 lakh people per year uh, you know this includes uh, the category of emigration and, and uh, non emigration uh, folks in terms of you know what your passport says the covid period has been difficult for everyone right i mean it's been difficult for us all of us personally it's been difficult uh, for businesses it's been difficult for entire industries to be honest with you uh, and the gcc countries uh, have uh, suffered equally in terms of their economies uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know loss of employment uh, with the result that a very large number of people expat talent has actually come back from the gcc um uh, some estimates uh, for indian workers returning from the gcc during covid is 7 lakhs plus now that's a large number right um but the hope uh, is that as the pandemic settles and, and as the pandemic eases uh, we're see seeing pretty much every major economy uh, rebound right this includes a major economy like india and uh, we hope that the gulf will not be an exception for this either um and to be honest with you as a staffing business Uh, and as a private uh, sector uh, you know which does uh, recruitment and skilling which is focused on the overseas we see a massive upsurge in demand for indian talent and manpower over the next 2 years we believe that the gcc will not only rehire a similar number of people the number of indians who have come back uh, not only will the gcc rehire uh, most of those uh, people who have migrated back but in the medium term we actually expect a massive spike because large infrastructure projects which is what the middle east thrives on uh, are sort of stuck you know they're in a limbo but when they have to be restarted you actually need more manpower than uh, you may have needed originally it's a little uh, perverse in that way but uh, for uh, demand for indian talent you know uh, i think it's a plus and i and i and i see good days ahead uh, once the pandemic starts easing uh, of course the only challenge over there will be that most of the people who will be rehired will be people with gcc experience and uh, since we are on the topic of skilling here i must mention that this is where i think the skilling ecosystem can play a part uh, you know uh, where the rehiring demand can be met through well skilled certified candidates who can then compete uh, with the experienced folks specifically so just talking about challenges and sort of trying to articulate those uh, you know the major challenge of course the world over is protectionism right there's a increasing localization coming into every industry oman saudi have completely localized jobs in banking finance uh, and a lot of these jobs aren't going to be available uh, to expats uh, and definitely not indians uh, uh, going forward so that's uh, that's a challenge uh, as the economies recover uh, there is also a uh, you know every economy suffered right so india competes in the international market with uh, talent and manpower from bangladesh sri lanka pakistan and all these countries unfortunately are going to be vying for sending their talent back um, and the countries that make it easiest right in terms of um, regulations in terms of uh, things like referral wages those are the countries which are going to speed ahead of others unfortunately uh automation of course is one of the biggest challenges it's global has nothing to do with the gcc even in construction uh we see that you know if you needed 10 people to build each slab in a certain amount of time today you need three so there's been a massive compression in jobs because in jobs which are repetitive in terms of automation so in industries like construction retail uh the need for repetitive and manual jobs keeps reducing dramatically on the other hand and i would like to end with a positive note which is the opportunities right Uh, large oil and gas projects uh, aren't going to stop you know much as we may want to vilify the fossil industry uh, the truth and the fact is that it's going to be around for the next decade or maybe two decades 
uh, and all the refineries which are right now uh, pretty much living on turnarounds you know short term shutdowns to sort of maintain the refineries are going to go in for major upgrades and major constructions which means there's going to be massive hiring um, these are high paying high skill oil and gas jobs so that's that's good news for uh, uh, indian workers several large infrastructure projects metro projects roads projects which are in limbo right now will be restarted because that's how the the gulf economy works it works in the contract system uh, and the hospitality you know we've all seen revenge tourism uh, the moment the economy restarts uh, people start heading out so we believe that hospitality will be the one industry which will be a big gainer next year in 2023 and uh, healthcare and it you know if if anything uh, that covid has taught us is that you need excellent frontline healthcare staff uh, and you need a lot of information technology so these are uh, industries which are talent deficient in every part of the world gcc europe us and indian talent in these two industries for a long time are going to be in high demand uh, i'll stop there arun and uh, hand it over back to you sure thanks uh, amit i think that gave us a good overview of the opportunity but it looks like an opportunity which needs to be uh, restudied in the new context because it's not that we can continue to service or provide this same kind of labor or the skill or the manpower which we are currently doing i'm sure many of these industries would uh, seek seek uh, skill sets uh, from the from say hospitality workers would uh, or even a construction worker they would seek skill sets which are probably different or uh, more than what was earlier they had uh, they had uh, i mean they would be hiring uh, or hiring for you know so thanks but the other thing which you brought about is intense competition which will also emerge uh, many other countries would start buying for the same space and because all economies uh, are going through a downturn so as you said uh, are just coming up so then almost all whether it's pakistan bangladesh uh, any of these countries it is it is going to be intense and i'm sure the differentiator would a big differentiator would be the skill and productive like productivity levels of our workers vis-a-vis -vis the Uh, workers from the rest of the uh, south asian countries kind of thing. so clearly that sets the context for i mean for the skill skill agenda itself how it should be um, and what is it it should focus on going forward in the next few years uh, as uh, amit speaks about the traditional markets uh, i would like to bring in uh, basabin and basab is like uh, although he is quite new compared to amit but he has been one of those uh, most one of the key very innovative companies which have been working in some of the new markets so while we continue to maintain our uh, competitive positioning within the traditional markets also important that we open up the new markets and here here i believe is where basab could bring his perspective of working in some of these markets so basab if you could kindly let us know uh, again from a same the way i asked amit what do you think are the opportunities in these new markets first of all which are the new markets you are targeting and what are the new what are the opportunities here and when you operate in these markets it will be obvious to you that the challenges we face our indian skill workers face can you also speak about them yeah uh, thanks arun one of the advantages of being the last speaker in a panel is that you are able to glean some things from what the people have said earlier uh a good afternoon and a very happy 75th anniversary of independence and of course this panel seeks to provide some window of opportunity to provide independence from unemployment just day before yesterday four top retail companies it was reported in the economic times that they're laying off 17000 people so which speaks of the urgency of what this panel and other players who are in this field can provide to the indian workforce but let me first talk about uh, the the global milieu and it's extremely exciting extremely exciting and i, I came into this field in 2017 working with the government and uh, i must tell you that uh, firstly let me start with some figures there's a mckinsey report on uh, global workforce which is dated somewhere in the last decade which says that by 2030 the global workforce will be about 3.5 billion and 10% of this workforce will need to be sourced from just two countries china and india these are the only two countries which can provide 
support and sustenance to a whole milieu of countries which are going to be short of talent, which are short of talent today. And the report goes on to say that given the kind of English speaking workforce that India has, India will replace China as the largest provider of workforce globally with about 60% of this workforce coming from India. Now, those are very, very large numbers. Uh, let me turn the page and take you to a report from the Manpower Group. Manpower Group is one of the largest human resource research organizations globally, and they provide an annual survey of how the workforce is looking at from an employer's perspective. So what is alarming news to a lot of countries is great news for us. So let me start. 86% of Japanese employers report more than 50% shortage of talent. 73% in Taiwan, 72% in Romania, 69% in Hong Kong, 66% in Turkey, 62% in Bulgaria, 59% in Greece. There's a UN report which talks about just the Far East, which we are not even looking at. Acute shortage of talent in Brunei, Singapore, Macau, Malaysia, Vietnam, South Korea. In a demographic challenge map, these countries are marked in red. So that's the scale of opportunity. Now, let me tell you about the diversity of opportunity. Uh, Amit talked a bit about the kind of trades which are available there. Now, we are exploring markets in North America, in Europe, uh, in Australia, New Zealand region, and in the Far East region. In all these three regions, we are now doing, uh, we have demands from trades in 17 industry sectors. So when I'm saying industry sectors, I'm talking about the sectors in which India has sector skill councils. There are 17 such sectors. Now this straddles through manufacturing services and even agriculture. So we are providing agronomists to Italy and agricultural workers and veterinary uh, professionals to US. Uh, we are signing a contract with Russia to provide uh, Indian workers over there. So that's the next thing I want to say that there is a great diversity of trades. So I can see somebody is asking a question to say which are the major sectors. It's, it's every sector. It's every sector. But there are some challenges we'll come to. The uh, last and the most exciting thing is from 2017 to now, we are gradually finding that the visa regimes which restrict the movement of talent from one nation to the other is moving from a rigid structure to a very fluid structure. So if you look at Canada, it has eased out its visa norms. If you look at Germany from 2019, it is allowing workers from third countries as uh, countries like India are called, which are outside the EU, uh, we are even allowed to send apprentices into countries like Germany, into countries like Switzerland, into countries like Austria, which work on this dual education system. Uh, what has happened with Japan is common knowledge. But uh, when I was at NSDC, I also knew that South Korea has signed an MOU with the government of Nagaland for a requirement of people equivalent to the TITP. So you can see the Far East opening up. Australia has opened up its visa categories. It has introduced short-term talent visas for a large number of categories, which are institutional. That means the government can source these candidates or employers can source these candidates. So uh, there is an easing of visa regime that we are finding, and every day it's different. So just two days back, the Prime Minister of New Zealand announced that New Zealand has no choice but to ease out the visa regime and allow skilled workers to come in. So that's the opportunity. Uh, now, challenges are many. And I think I will, I will say that uh, uh, the regulatory requirements to, to be able to breach them uh, in greenfield uh, countries or in greenfield sectors uh, is about it, it takes about 70% of our effort. Uh, 
most of the countries other than the regulatory where there is there's fluidity in regulatory requirement there will be skill issues so that's what i'm very interested and intrigued by what sita said about uh, creating the uh, common competency models of roles that we are struggling to do with many countries it's a great initiative that nsdc has taken to create international uh, or transnational competencies that's the way for the future language is a huge requirement so again to people who are posting uh, um, questions to say uh, what what should be done i would say learn a foreign language what are the language you must learn learn english map yourself to the ilts english 63 countries which are english speaking require ilts requirements if you want to go to those countries of course german is again a very exciting uh, area it is the center of europe the center of the world uh, japanese is again a language you must learn and there are any number of good such uh, places of course culture is something that needs a fitment uh, it's a it's a very very important part of our selection criteria to see that there's a commonality of culture between the candidate and that country uh let me just at this point give you the experience of the supply side that we have had over the last 4 years 90% of the youth that we contact say humko naukri de do germany mein humko naukri de do they just don't want to go through any kind of skill upgrade for going overseas that's that's the first challenge the second challenge of course is finance the better guys don't have the money the guys who have the money we don't want to set so uh, there are assured jobs how can we ensure that there is a financial ecosystem which is able to support this uh, inequity or this challenge trust is a big factor and thank you government of india and nsdc for creating the india international skill centers which along with the uh, ra license are uh, big comfort factors but still we feel that the branding of international skilling and placement as it happens in philippines that sita was talking about or in bangladesh for that matter where there's a minister exclusively dedicated for overseas bangladeshis and promoting that or even nepal for that matter there needs to be some kind of a movement like pmkvy what can we do to ensure that people understand that overseas opportunity is something that the government also is encouraging so i will stop here and uh, hand over the mic back to arun sure but sir i think that was a very good uh, what do you call overview of the landscape other than gcc and what you say uh, when i hear when we hear you is that the opportunity is something to be tapped but then as you also put in uh, things like uh, positive things about visa norms getting relaxed and i like the way, the word the, the way you said that learn a language i think it is going to be an important thing going forward uh, then the focus on finance i'll come to that focus on trust and the need for branding uh, uh, i think you brought out very very good points when it comes to addressing uh, bringing points about the opportunity and the challenge uh, since ma'am is not uh, ma'am has not joined uh, i would take uh, i would take a few minutes to speak out what i take a few minutes to speak out what the government is doing in this space yes. uh, so that it's uh, it helps us when we move the next set of uh, uh, next round of discussions where we talk about how can a government and business work together to address this opportunity and uh, neutralize this uh, uh, the challenges we speak of uh, as a government uh, i think it is it is it is dawned on us that now that uh, this initiative has to be led by the business uh, it cannot be a government led kind of initiative uh, simply because this as i right i spoke in the beginning itself uh, uh, about this demand uh, being entirely demand driven who can understand demand but better than the market you know people who are market players you know? so therefore it has to be the the tip of the spear has to be business and government has to be following i think there's an infrastructure issue with arun
Sita, what can what can we do to keep the audience engaged? Would you want to shoot a question at Amit or me? Um, okay, uh, perhaps I can. Um, maybe I think one of the things that is very key and might be good to hear is um, in what way have has okay Arun is back. Let him. Yeah. Let him move. I'm so sorry. I lost it. I lost power at home. <laughs> so sorry. So it is obvious that uh, the business has to be the uh, the one leading the charge, and the government back provides a backstop for it. So just an example, uh, the Japan initiative. Uh, when the government has been uh, uh, instrumental in opening the doors, uh, from opening the doors to the Japan market. Uh, what has driven this current initiative in terms of close to 200 persons uh, actually working in Japan, you know, which is a very difficult market to get in, has been the innovation and the entrepreneurial skills of the people who are running these, uh, uh, these skilling agencies and uh, skilling and placement agencies. So therefore, it is obvious that the government plays a role the way it does in, uh, and, and specifically, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry about this. So uh, the first thing is the government, uh, uh, while we may think that we make those places that we will send X lakhs of people to some country, etc. The government just cannot do all those. It cannot mandate that this is the amount of, this is the kind of uh, target which we'll try to achieve, etc. All it can do is to create enabling conditions for it. And uh, that area, in those areas, uh, first thing I said, the way it has worked in Japan is a very good model, uh, which could be replicated for other countries, where it means the government does G2G kind of interaction. It, it, it tries to address the uh, visa issues, it tries to uh, work the uh, through its embassies, it works with the law, with, this, with those foreign governments to enable this, this uh, mobility of workers. Second, as Basab put it, in which government will come and uh, the sending a person to go from where he is now being skilled and also moving to a foreign market, it requires a lot of money comparatively, relatively for that person. You know? So it requires probably from, from a lack to, to, to go to these countries, including training in languages or any of those kind of upgradation skills. So that's area of focus for the government, and I'm uh, and uh, although I I don't speak fully for the government, but there is a drive to initiate a lot of skill loans in this market, which can support this uh, in, uh, support this movement of people, and, I, and that is there is already a, 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 a mandate to the to the banks to uh, to fund these initiatives, but obviously it has not happened because. Uh, there are certain uh, issues which the uh, bankers themselves face when it, when they try to give these loans. So then we have identified some of this. It could be in the form of guarantee or it could be in terms of interest, etc. But these are areas which the, as government we are working on these things. Uh, finally, I think that is the third area is about working on agents like below. Giving a picture to the market. In the sense, we can do a lot of research and able to show the market that, like, that these are the countries that there is opportunity existing, and then when they do some pilots, smart pilots with the with the players, open the market up, and then of course then we use methods in which more and more people could go to these markets. So these are areas which government is working on, <clears throat> but I would like to hear from you, Sita. Uh, Rob, when you look at the international, uh, you look at internationally, I'm sure you have come across various government uh, doing a lot of things for their own uh, skilled workforce. Do you think there are some best practices or case studies we should look at uh, as India, we should be looking at these and maybe incorporating some of those learnings? Okay. So thanks, Arun. I would just like to actually add to what you're saying because I think while... Uh, it's great to think that the private sector will take um, some kind of lead. Uh, it's also very important to recognize the role that the government has been playing as well. Uh, and I think there are many things that like, and I will talk about some of this a little bit. 
uh, it's the spaces that are not connected. So the fact that India has social security agreements for intercorporate transferees makes a very big difference for people who are migrating on short term to countries like Europe. Um, they are huge in protecting, uh, you know, people's uh, pension funds and uh, taxations and things like that. And those are systems that the government has put in place. They are robust, they work, and they're expanding. There are also uh, like the mobility partnership, for example, which has been signed with France. If you actually look at it, there is room for skilling, there is room for apprenticeships, there is room for education, there's all of that. So I think this is a huge role that the government of India plays in terms of creating the those facilitating spaces for engagement. Uh, we are currently working um, with the ministry to look at the UK. And this is very new, uh, but we know that the uh, UK government is very interested in looking at health worker mobility from India. Um, and, and it's true that when there is bilateral agreement and when the two sides are talking, the two governments are in conversation, it actually facilitates the process and makes it faster and easier to bring in other stakeholders and actually move things forward. So I think I will start by saying there's a very critical role that the governments play in laying the larger frameworks. Of course, when it comes to the practicalities, we've got to get other stakeholders, but the government does play that very critical role. Uh, and that cannot be taken away. I mean, it's as simple as there was there was a small exchange between the two governments. And I know exactly the two professions in the healthcare sector that UK is looking for. You know, it's very quick when it is between governments in some ways, right? Um, so looking at some of those angles. Uh, but then I'll give you some examples because you've asked specifically for private sector engagement. We've been working with the EU India side as a technical partner to the two governments. Um, and we've had a lot of private sector engagement on this. Uh, we facilitated conversations. Um, so what we have is like an entity like NASCOM, which looks at the entire, obviously, ICT sector and is part of the skilling space as well. Um, not just looking at skills, but looking at what is blocking people from migrating. What is that? Con so it's looking at visa regimes. It's looking at you know social security. It's looking at some of these aspects. And we have been able to facilitate that conversation with the EU. In fact, NASCOM contributes to EU's visa policy that they're making for the transference of uh, ICT workers, which is great because those are the conversations that help open some of these doors and also make it, you know, it's practical in terms of what can or cannot work. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but it's quite, I mean, we've done events with sectoral events. So we worked with the auto sector, for example, because it's quite a big sector where there's a lot of investment from Europe as well in India. And there's quite a lot of movement of people. And we discovered that some of the interesting things there were spouse visas. Um, they really want women to join that sector. They have a very bad gender division in that sector. So com companies are looking for women to work in that sector. So if they're going to look at migrant, it would be great if they had migrant women who were qualified to take some of those jobs. Um, we looked at startups, interestingly enough, and, and we found a very interesting space there because while everyone wants startups to come, what is happening to visa regimes behind that? How do people come with the startups? Um, and we found that countries have e-visas. They give e-residencies. Estonia, for example, yeah. um, just opens the doors uh, in terms of residencies for people wanting to set up startups. Yeah. It just makes it so yeah. much easier for people to just come in and establish themselves there. Yeah. That a lot of Indian yeah. startups actually also take advantage of those situations. India needs to also perhaps learn from some of those. India has a lot going on, but also India needs to pick up on some of that. But I'll also um, share examples, and Amit is sitting here with me. Uh, we've looked at technology also. We've looked at, you know, we do various, we've done a small pilot uh, where we looked at a technology technology platform and could we recruit from the skilling space directly so could we do more direct uh, recruitment without going through layers of sub agents directly recruiting from a skilling space uh, we learned uh, in that that you need a recruiter uh, we definitely learned that that you need the soft handling of skills that need to be taught uh, forms that need to be filled um, tests that need to be taken whatever and you need hand holding with a trustworthy agency you need someone who can do that with trust of the people um, so i think um, those there are um, but i'll tell you 
a little bit more. Um, we've been also working with one of the state governments where we helped them to set up an entire policy on migration. And some of the things that we were able to do is attract trainers from overseas to come into partnership with some of these state governments, which really helps to upskill to a level that is required in that country. So they know the market, um, they know how to get the jobs, they know also what level of training is required. So some of that is extremely helpful. We did facilitate, we used the diaspora to facilitate um, employers meetings with governments so that they could understand the kind of market needs that there are in other countries. And this is where the interface of migration employment skills actually begins to come together and where uh, intersectoral players need to start coming together. Um, for me, I think in this uh, in the space that we are in India, we certainly need to see much more transparency, communication, trust building, and lots more coordination to take place. Um, I think each agency on their own is doing a lot of really good work, uh, but it's not coming together somehow. I think lots more can be done to facilitate this to happen. We worked with the recruiters. We were one of those first agencies who actually approached the recruiters and helped them to form their associations so that dialogue platforms could be created, largely to talk to the Ministry of External Affairs, because that's where their licenses sit, uh, but also the first ever engagement with the NSDA was actually done with ILO introducing some of these recruiters in there. So I think we're very happy to play those roles. We're very happy to bring in some of these different stakeholders, um, but, but never undermining the private sector. The private sector is a huge player in this. Um, we understand that recruiters understand markets. Um, we also understand that they are key in handholding the migrant to make it from one country to the other. Um, we also think that there are other players who are very important we've used unions to do integration work in countries of destination which has been very very helpful um so in all of this um i really just uh, feel that if we could all just do lots more coordination lots more coming together we're happy to facilitate this by the way for example for the uk uh, india dialogue on health workers we created the market document in a way so we made a document says hey india has these skills india has this potential india has so many colleges india has so many students coming out with so many different kind of degrees this is the kind of market information that is not available i mean it's not handy for people to use and we need to develop some of this if you're looking at taking india forward um it's much easier for us to reach out to an embassy and get that facilitation done in another country but i think it would be very important to take some of our trusted partners from here into those market meetings um you know there are meetings that can be facilitated like i said with the diaspora we facilitated meetings it's going to be very important to take all your trusted partners with you on this and to showcase india much more collectively um as one you know so everybody comes together to showcase what india brings on the table this is our constant effort as the ilo to try and see how we can support all sides um both countries of origin and destination also to be in conversation but also within a country of origin to look at all the stakeholders coming together so that there can be a coordinated movement of uh, migration there can be coordinated efforts to make migration successful for everyone thank you that's really all i have to say See that that was good. Lots of coordination. That's what you you just pointed out. So I'll just bring in uh, Amit on this. Amit, uh, how do you look at this in the sense how can governments and businesses work together? Uh, you are a, from a private sector perspective. What would be your ask from a uh, from a government? And uh, how do you think we could work together? And if, let's say. We bring in Sita to coordinate us, but what do we do working together? Can you just put it? Can you speak about it? Sure. Thanks for that, Arun. And uh, yes, very articulately put. I think Sita's uh, and Basab have already covered a lot of the points. But I do want to say one is, of course, Arun, the IISC initiative. Uh, you know, I think it's a great initiative. I think it's. Uh, I haven't seen it in other countries, so I think it's a great uh, public-private uh, partnership kind of model very well intentioned uh, i know we're still waiting for a lot of results but i'm positive that you know it's headed in the in a good direction so the uh, the private sector plays the nimble business development market entry role and nsdc and uh, the powers that be behind them uh, play the platform and the policy role i think it's brilliant and uh, i hope you know that that the uh, uh, network is strengthened from the government side and uh, it's strengthened uh, with funding it's strengthened with uh, larger networks um 
language training. Basab has already mentioned this. I think we should be introducing German and English as electives in a lot of schools uh, which are labor uh, surplus. Uh, English should be made mandatory uh, in a lot of uh, places where it's not because I think that's a requirement for jobs in India and definitely for countries uh, and regions like Europe. And I, I know we're going to we're, we're running out of time. So the most important point which was covered by you as well as Basab uh, was the cost of migration. Now, this actually becomes a huge obstacle for Indians uh, to go abroad to newer geographies like Japan, Europe, uh, even the US. And, uh, you know, I know you've talked about loan facilities, uh, but really that uh, we really need to be putting our shoulder to that problem and resolving that problem because that will allow us to go and pitch Indian talent solutions, um, you know, in a much stronger way. See, Indian talent, we already know is, I don't want to use the word superior, but definitely more preferred in most regions in the world. And, you know, that has various re uh, reasons behind it, cultural, uh, proficiency, productivity, etc. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you can make it financially uh, reasonable or at least at financial parity, uh, uh, from, uh, you know, recruiting a worker from India versus recruiting a worker from Vietnam, that goes a long way in, uh, you know, getting employers motivated to hire uh, more Indians. The second, uh, you know, and this is something that, you know, I, I think NSDC is uniquely placed to play a big role in, is in the creation of unique uh, insurance schemes to cover the risks of employment. So, you know, uh, we know that the value chain of a candidate, uh, when they or he or she gets skilled in India, recruited in India, migration abroad, and then two years or three years of employment abroad. Now, uh, this this is a human resource business. Th these are humans we're dealing with. So there's there's a lot of issues that could, can take place and do take place. I mean, even at a family dinner table, we can't normally two people can't agree on what they want to eat together. Right. So when you have a, a, a situation where uh, there is employment happening in a foreign place, there are a lot of issues that can take place. Now, we've been exploring a lot with different government departments about creating insurance schemes to cover some of these risks. I think uh, this will go a long way in also uh, reducing some of the financial burden on the candidates, on the employers, as well as the stakeholders in India. So I would urge uh, NSDC to think about uh, the creation of insurance schemes along with uh, uh, the, uh, the bank loan uh, facilities as well. Uh, I'll stop at this point, Arun. Thanks for this opportunity. Yes. What's up? Um, you want to have the last word on this? Uh, how do you think governments and business should work together? You're on mute. Basab, you're on mute. Uh, um, I'm sure this is not the last word. Uh, there'll be much more <laughs> spoken. But uh, very quickly, I would say at a strategic level, uh, the, the MEA can be a great enabler. Uh, some of the missions we have found are very, very proactive. And for example, Croatia, Russia, Japan, where they uh, they look at uh, talent sourcing as also one area of business which they are to source. So can it be done across many countries? Second, with MEA, you know, the, the MOU with Finland is sitting from 2007. It's a public document on the website. So uh, Sweden, uh, there are MOUs. And Sita just now said there's an MOU with France, which I didn't know about. So can we unlock these? Can we have a workshop with... Uh, the IISCs who are keen to work in those geographies to see how uh, public-private engagement can happen. We are happy to travel to these countries. Let us get whatever, you know, if there's a demand coming into uh, the MEA, there must be some process by which it gets to MSDE and then to NSDC and then they need to get processed. So that's at a strategic level. Second, I must appreciate along with the ISC initiative, the way NSDC is working across Japan, Australia, Russia. These are very good initiatives where you are enabling markets through pilots. Please keep this good work going. This is this is great. Third, uh, build the brand of IISC is that Amit was saying, but also connect to the talent chain. Now, you know, PM, KVY and others are semi dry now. So how can the whole universe of training providers monetize the international skilling opportunity? Should the IISCs rebuild infrastructure, uh, invest in uh, mobilization and sourcing, or can there be some partnership with training providers who already have this is something we can think of. 
and of course uh, skill loans with an first first loan default guarantee the fldg these are the few things i thought sure. are helpful sure. so i think we have run we are run out of time but let me tell you as three speakers and the panelists we managed to finish we managed to do it without the fourth speaker so it's good for us you know uh, but just summarizing uh, as you rightly as many of you pointed out uh, the supply side the ic network being strengthening language becoming an important language training becoming important reducing the cost of migration uh, and and amit spoke about insurance being a key element in addressing the risks of uh, risks of this employer uh, risks of this potential migrants etc uh, on the demand side well uh, as again many of you spoke that uh, the companies are better placed to address the demand but facilitation support required to embassies uh, to various uh, connects etc and including multilateral agencies like ilo is something which in fact market information is key that is something which is missing now so if some of those things could be brought on the demand side this would be and putting this together and matching both the demand and supply and then uh, which requires as sita said hell lot of coordination and showcasing collectively as again as she pointed out the india brand the fact that india has a lot of talent i think is something which we all should work towards uh, thank you thank you very much each one of you contributed so well for to this session and made my job easy thank you very much and a very happy independence day thank, 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 thank you thank you arun thank you everyone thank you thank you arun for sharing the session so well thank you all the panelists for joining us today and sharing your insights i'm sure they'll reach the right and concerned stakeholders you may now close your windows to exit the session automatically